Center. My name is Julia. I'm the Artistic Programs Manager at the Playwright Center, and we're very glad to have you here. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, you'll be able to see and hear me and the participants, um, but we are not going to see or hear you. So wherever you're viewing this, whether that's on Facebook or on uh, HowlRound's website or the Playwright Center's website, you don't have to worry about having a microphone or video or anything like that. If you have any questions or run into some problems, uh, you can reach me at questions at pwcenter.org or I'll also be keeping an eye on the comment section on Facebook if you're viewing uh, the Facebook Live as well. So I'll try to address any questions there. And we are just about ready to get started. So I will turn things over to our producing artistic director, Jeremy Cohen, and we'll take it from there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everybody. I wanna see all of you and especially because We've been getting somewhere between like 500 and 700 people tuning in uh, to these events. And uh, so it would be so great to say hello to all 500 of you uh, or more. Um, welcome to the Playwright Center. My name is Jeremy Cohen and I am the producing artistic director here. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and on behalf of our board and our staff and the over 2200 playwrights that we support every year here at the Playwright Center, I am so thrilled to welcome you to the second conversation of our Four Conversations Summer Series. This conversation is called Transforming Artistic Relationships. We have folks tuning in online from all over the globe right now to be with us today, and I want to send you all so much love and health from us here in the Twin Cities. In the middle of this moment of justice, of activism, art making and transformation, we are gathering together this summer to hear from an extraordinary set of artists. Here at the Playwright Center, we value the centering of artist leadership and how we approach all of our work. And so today's conversation has gathered some of the smartest, most incredible artists that I know to weigh in on finding more authentic, uh, deeper and more powerful relationships between playwrights and theaters, especially in this new world uh, going forward. We have two other amazing conversations coming up in August. The next one is on Tuesday, August 11th at seven o'clock central uh, and focuses on writing across mediums uh, and includes the brilliant playwrights Amphonisa Odafia, Jen Silverman, and Sarah Gubbins, uh, who all are writing plays and screenplays and TV shows and novels and poetry and so much more. Uh, and details on all those conversations can be found at pwcenter.org. Uh, this panel tonight and the four-part series is co-produced with the amazing HowlRound Theatre Commons. Uh, in addition to being live streamed on HowlRound TV, the conversation is informed by HowlRound's amazing long-standing work with the Mellon Foundation on the National Playwright Residency Program. Three of our panelists tonight uh, are or have been involved with the program, so we're very excited to share more about their experiences in a minute. And I especially want to send a big shout out to my great colleague Ramona King at HowlRound for her amazing partnership on putting this panel together in the last couple of months and this whole series. I also want to send a special thanks to our supporting sponsor for this series, Knock Inc., whose underwriting has helped bring tonight's conversation to you free of charge while ensuring that all of the artists are paid for their time and their work, as must happen. For nearly 50 years, the Playwright Center has worked to provide a platform for a wide diversity of voices and to create deeply accessible programming by making all public events like this one free. We serve a global community of over 2,200 uh, playwright members, uh, providing submission opportunities and classes and playwright gatherings, script feedback, and lots more resources. So if tonight's conversation inspires you, uh, we hope that you will uh, help us in our mission and consider making a tax deductible donation. Gifts of any size make a huge impact. Visit pwcenter.org slash donate. Um, and if you're interested in learning about our membership pro program, please visit pwcenter.org slash join. Finally, another big effort coming out of the amazing Twin Cities uh, theater company, True Roots, uh, in collaboration with the Playwright Center this summer has been a moment of silence, which is a living historical archive and celebration of blackness launched through the commissioning of over 55 black Minnesotan artists and voices in this moment of transformation in response to the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, etc. The extraordinary Shea Cage is the curator and the artistic lead on this project and the on anthology is online now. You can find it at blackmnvoices.com. Again, that's black 
mnvoices.com. The pieces are rotating throughout the next few months. So um, we really hope you'll get a chance to check it out. Uh, it is powerful and beautiful and joyful and mournful writing um, by uh, just an incredible cohort of artists. So we hope you will join us uh, at blackmnvoices.com. Uh, tonight's discussion will be approximately about 90 minutes. There's going to be a Q&A section uh, in the last third of the conversation. Um, I'll give you a heads up when it's time to send your questions in to us, and then uh, we'll take some time to hear your thoughts and respond. Um, you can email us, as Julia mentioned before, at questions at pwcenter.org, or if you're viewing this live stream on Facebook, post your question in the comment section there and we'll pull it off. Um, but again, the email for the questions is questions at pwcenter.org. All right, let's get into the conversation. And to do so, please, please help me welcome to this screen, Alyssa Adams, Pearl Clegg, Leslie Ishii, Harrison David Rivers, and Vera Starbert. 650 people are clapping for you. <laughs> Hi friends, how you doing tonight? We're good. It's so lovely yeah, to have you. you all here. I'm going to do, please don't be embarrassed, I'm going to do very quick micro bios for all of you um, uh, because I'd love to introduce the audience just a little bit to, to who you are. Um, so hold, hold tight, everyone. Uh, Alyssa Adams uh, is the Associate Artistic Director at Theatre Latte Da. Uh, she spent 19 seasons as the Director of New Play Development at Children's Theatre Company, where she commissioned and developed more than 45 new plays and musicals that premiered at Children's Theatre Company and went on to productions across the country. She also served as the Literary Manager at La Jolla Playhouse and the Director of Playwright Services here at the Playwright Center. Alyssa Adams. Pearl Clegg. Oh, Pearl Clegg, I love so very much, is the distinguished artist in residence at the Alliance Theater in Atlanta. She's the author of more than 20 plays, including Blues for an Alabama Sky, Fly in West, and The Angry, Raucous, and Shamelessly Gorgeous. She's also the author of eight novels, speaking of writing across mediums, three books of poetry and a memoir, Things I Should Have Told My Daughter, Lies, Lessons, and Love Affairs. Please help me welcome Pearl Clegg. Leslie Ishii is the artistic director of the Incredible Perseverance Theater in Alaska. Leslie is an artist, a cultural community organizer, and a social justice warrior for people in theater and the arts and culture sector. She has an amazing acting career uh, in Asian American, ethnic specific, multicultural, regional theaters on Broadway and on camera. Please help me welcome the amazing Leslie Ishii. Harrison David River, I'm clapping. This is my like 650 person clap of joy, Harrison. Harrison David Rivers is a playwright. He is the winner of the 2018 Relentless Award for his gorgeous play, The Bandaged Place, developed at the Playwright Center. He is the recipient of McKnight, Jerome, and Van Leer fellowships and residencies with the Boliosco Foundation, the Siena Art Institute, the Hermitage, Duke University, New York Theater Workshop, New York Stage and Film, and Williamstown Theater Festival, and the Playwright Center. Please help me welcome Harrison David Rivers. And finally, last but certainly not least, the amazing Vera Starbird. Uh, Vera is a writer and editor. She was born on Prince of Wales Island and grew up all over Alaska. She is the playwright in residence at Perseverance Theater with Leslie through the Andrew W. Mellon National Playwriting Residency Program. She's the editor of First Alaskans Magazine and writer for the PBS Kids Children's Program, Molly of Denali, which by the way, recently won a Peabody Award. Congrats, Vera, and welcome Vera Starbird. Yes, so happy to have you all here. Um, all right, we ready to dig in, friends? We're ready, everyone seems ready, all right. So I was thinking about where we are right now in the world a little bit tonight and, um, you know, going through this moment together, I've spent time with a bunch of you, you know, we're learning whole new ideas and understandings of the world. And um, people are always saying, how's it going at the Playwright Center? Um, and I'm saying, we're learning and we're leaning in. We're leaning in deeply into our work of supporting playwrights and theater makers, their work, their lives, their entire personage and it remains at the forefront of all we do. But of course, this period of time has us continuing to think very deeply about the opportunity that's in front of us right now. That is theater artists. The idea of change and reinvention is part of our DNA. It's a natural piece of any artistic process. And I think even more so, we're seeing this opportunity as a time where 
I hope we are and we will continue to look to our individual artists, our freelance artists, our brilliant expressive thinkers and storytellers who continue to demonstrate their leadership in myriad ways. Most historians would offer, and I was reading a thing about it the other day, that there have been some post-crisis periods uh, where true recreation and reimagining has happened more quickly and more deeply than it would have otherwise. And I believe that about this moment. I've been part of many of those conversations in the last number of months already. But of course, the converse is the attempt to go back to the way it was could very well have us ending up in a vacuum of reaching for something that no longer exists and no longer works. So tonight, I really want all of us to share and talk about this necessary change and about new models. I put an exclamation point in my thought on it. New models. It sounds like such a non profit phrase, but I really mean it. I'm really excited to hear from all of you about what's been working and what you're dreaming about. So let's start with the playwrights in the panel. Um, can the three of you maybe talk just briefly about either your current or past relationship or residency that you're in or that you've done? And what did you learn from that collaboration that you want to take forward in your work and into maybe other professional situations? <laughs> Like, Pearl, because, can we start, start with you? Yeah. <laughs> you're, Pearl. you're Pearl Clegg. Can we start with you? Um, I, uh, I was very fortunate to be one of the uh, first of the uh, cohorts of the Mellon uh, grant, which I um, still think is such a progressive, wonderful idea to embed playwrights in an American theater um, because playwrights tend to go in for rehearsal and we stay for the opening night and then we go. Um, this idea of embedding playwrights in a theater so that you're there um, every day, so that you're there as a senior staff member, so that you can really be a part of the, the life um, of that theater, I think is such an important idea and is so necessary because a lot of this work that we do begins with a script written by a playwright, so that if you have a playwright around all the time, talking about everything that goes on in that, that theater, I don't think it can help but be a good thing. Um, my experience at the Alliance was absolutely wonderful, continues to be wonderful after the, our two um, sessions with the Mellon um, grant uh, concluded. Uh, they offered to um, have me stay at the Alliance as distinguished artist in residence, which I was very um, honored and pleased to do. So that I think that those, um, those playwrights all have different stories about how their cohort went, about how their relationship with the theater went. But for me, it was a very, um, it was a perfect time to do it. And it allowed me to do all kinds of work um, and establish all kinds of collaborative relationships that I don't think I would have had. And Vera, where are you in your residency with Perseverance? And how's that going so far? I'm in the fourth year um so the sort of just finished the first year of the second cohort we have fun with trying to figure out what year i'm in four <laughs> four years in um and it's been i mean career changing to be able to just be a writer and that's my job versus um sort of trying to find the next job and the next job um I'll, although it's funny that the very first play that i did at perseverance before uh, being in this residency, I didn't actually realize how unusual it was for me to just hang around. When you say like they go away after um, opening night, I hung around <laughs> <laughs> the audience. Um, uh, Larissa Fasthurst, who's my mentor and mentored on that play and directed that play, gave me the advice to watch the audience. And I every night I went to just about every performance. Um, and I got a lot of comments about, <laughs> you're still here. Or, you know, and a lot of times it's good. Like, I'm glad you're still here, but it's like, what do they think I'm going to do? This is my story. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to see this through. And I did that, you know, this last production and it, that's just what I'm going to do. At the same time, um, you know, I wasn't being paid to be there. I was just there. <laughs> I, was out. I hung out every, every show. Um, how it's changed to be sort of, that's my job now. And that's part of it has been night and day from that first experience with Perseverance to this past fall, three and a half years in, um, I was a lot more confident in what I was able to ask of the theater um, 
and what and what we're talking about as far as like relationships with the theater to be able to have the confidence to say I really think this is important for my play and in some cases I expect this to happen with my play um, there's an awful lot of agency that I had that wouldn't ordinarily be there um, and to perseverance's credit they tried to make all of those things happen um, and what couldn't happen was pretty tough anyways so it's I do believe my presence there has changed it because of the relationships of artists that we've been able to work and that work in those productions and in indigenize theater um, and it's changed me a lot in just honestly giving me both confidence and the security to be able to say these things without being worried that they're not going to work with me again. They have to work with me. <laughs> and no, they want to work with me, obviously. But um, yeah, there's it's it's been a pretty cool experience. And I am starting to understand how unusual it is um, in the sort of playwright theater experience. I have a follow-up question, but I'm going to hold it for a second because I want to ask all three of you. Harrison, can you share a little bit about, um, and you can talk about Latte Dub because Liz, Liz is here, but you can also feel free to talk about other kind of um, either residencies, I know you at Williamstown and other places where you've spent some real time as a playwright. Sure. Um, you know, I think since I started writing, it's always been really important to me to find my people. Um, that's sort of been central to uh, my creative process is finding the people who um, believe in me and my voice, who are advocates for me, who make space for me, um, uh, space for me to dream, to imagine, um, and who uh, sort of push me forward, who uh, don't let me sit on my laurels, but are always sort of inquiring and asking and pushing um, and when I first moved to the Twin Cities in 2014, one of the first emails that I sent was to Peter Rothstein at Theatre La Teda. Um, I am very interested in musical theater and I had heard that he was making beautiful musical theater at Theatre La Teda and I, I wanted in, uh, frankly, I wanted in. So <laughs> I said, I want in. And um, I was very fortunate, uh, I think a year after I arrived and sent that email, um, I was workshopping a musical with Theater La Teda and then have gone on to have two productions there. Um, and I think Alyssa can sort of speak to what La Teda is doing in their upcoming season, which I think is really exciting. Um, but I've been commissioned to sort of develop two projects in the season in lieu of production, but sort of moving things forward and allowing audiences access to the process. Um, so sort of back to my first point about finding your people, um, I, I feel like Theatre La Teda is, is certainly a home um, in the Twin Cities. Uh, I think along with Penumbra, along with the Playwright Center for me, like there are good people at all of those institutions who are pushing me forward. And I, I feel really fortunate um, uh, to be able to create work with people who I think make me a better human being, a better thinker, a better writer, um, a better artist. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited about uh, what's to come. I'm gonna ask the follow-up question and, and Pearl, you've spent so much time in, and because you're there now too, I'm so curious to hear in Atlanta what's happening, but you've been talking about um, the relationship between you as an artist, you as a playwright and the theater, uh, the theater staff maybe, sort of the internal part. I'm curious, and Vera, it was, it, when you were talking, it was making me think about it. Are there experiences where you've connected with audiences where someone has said, oh my God, I love this play. And you're like, oh, I'm actually the playwright or they had questions or or, there, or that your presence being there unlocked something for them because you were there in the audience or in discussion uh, one night. Are you, are you asking me? Are you, sure, asking yeah, here? yeah, let's start with you, yeah. Um, yeah, all the time, but I, I love that. I mean, I think that's the, you know, that's the fun of being there night after night. That's, you know, I understand exactly because I'm always there. I always sit in the same seat near the back um, so that if it doesn't go well, I can slip out. No one knows I was there. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I think it's a wonderful um, way for people to begin to talk to a living playwright, you know, talk to the writer. They've just seen your play. They want to tell you something about that play, um, either critique it for you, but more often 
They want to tell you that they saw something about themselves um, in that play, which is wonderful. Um, and then they, they will tell you the story. You know, I wrote a play with a grandmother um, who resonated with a lot of um, people and they would come to me and say, oh my God, that, that reminded me of my own grandmother. And then I would say, isn't it wonderful? All grandmothers are the same. They all give the same advice to their granddaughters. And then they would start to tell me about what their grandmother told them. So that I think that the, um, the idea that people can't enjoy a story about someone who is not exactly like them um, is just a myth and it's not true at all. I think if, um, you know, if people find a story uh, where they believe the other human beings are really human beings, they'll always be able to find something of themselves in that story. And I think people want that. Um, I know that's what I want um, when I go to the theater. I want to find something where I can say, yes, I resonate with that as a human being. Not necessarily that every show has to be written by a Black woman, starring a Black woman, all of that. Um, but what I want is something I can believe, something that is a real person grounded in a reality that I recognize. And then I'm good. I don't care what their specifics are. You know, convince me and then take me somewhere. Um, and I grew up doing that, you know, where you, you learn to read other people's stories. Um, and I think the problem comes in when people who have been privileged all their lives and have only read stories about themselves, written by themselves, for themselves, about themselves, it comes as a shock um, to realize that they can also find themselves in other people's stories. But usually it's a good shock. Like, wow, this is great. You know, all grandmothers are the same. And I think that's wonderful. Vera, I'm curious for you, um, what did it mean or what was even the progression of you being in the audience in terms of you connecting with people or just you being there and what that meant about peeling, people feeling like, yeah, I can be in this space. This is my space too. Yeah, it, it was in a really different experience from that first play. Some of that first play, it was about, this is my story and I want to see it through. It was literally sort of this fictional biography of my um, experience when my child childhood sexual abuse was discovered by my mother. Um, and it was a really heavy story and we had um, counselors there at every single performance to make sure you know, that brought stuff up for the audience they were there. So there was part of that almost responsibility of feeling like I should be there. Um, I do have training in um, adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. I, I wanted to be there. Um, and I think initially I was prepared for that. And honestly, I was prepared for some anger. The story is about how um, members of the family and the community um, really ostracized us. <laughs> so I was really very nervous about what would happen from that play. And for being so afraid and being so um, nervous and apprehensive and wanting to sort of be there to justify it immediately. And I'm gonna get emotional just thinking about it. The just love that came out of the audience every single night. Um, a lot of silence. There was a lot of just sort of quiet contemplation which spoke very loudly to me, um, but an awful lot of um, gratitude, yes, which is nice when you're so nervous, but the most profound thing was they came out of it say, telling about their own stories. Almost nobody came out of there talking about my story they all came out of that just spilling what they had never spoken before. And that was one of the most memorable things I'll ever experience, which is what drove me to kind of go again and again. Um, and it said an awful lot about this very specific cultural family story I was telling, how universal it felt to them and spoke to their, their stories. Um, to now <laughs> sort of uh, bringing it to the, the most recent production um, to have so many native people, especially Clinket people, comment about the love of culture, which is really this, that whole play was a gift to the Clinket culture that I love. And I was wanting to see that. I was not expecting to see the primarily white audience come out and feel like they had experienced the culture, which was also a wonderful thing, and talk about it and ask me questions about it. So those were very different experiences. I didn't get a lot of questions. The first one, I got a lot of, here's my story. The second one, it was, tell me more. Um, so both of those, so different and yet gratifying in their own ways. 
and it did change their experience of the play being able to take talk to the playwright the storyteller in in our culture it's just the storyteller um to be able to tell talk to the storyteller about maybe what they meant by it or what um, was intended there but more often than not what they got from it almost almost always it was what they got from it which i love to hear it's amazing it does it's that it that to to him to embed an artist, to multiple artists at the center of your work really is, there, there's just, there's this unending um, well of possible conversation and experience and exchange. And those are the things that, uh, you know, Leslie was, when, when Leslie got on the call early, we were saying, oh, we miss you. We just want to hug everyone. Like, you know, probably all want to hug everyone. But the other piece of that too is, you know, um, I think there is this desire, obviously there's this desire for connection that, um, and an experience like that, that is so visceral and so somatic in a way in their own bodies, um, feels like, wow, to have the storyteller right there with them, that's, that's everything. Um, Alyssa and Leslie, I'm gonna to move to you for a sec um, and, and ask kind of what's your bit experience been in terms of engaging with writers in either more of a residency way or a longer term uh, engagement at theaters and in your process as well. Maybe Leslie, would you mind sharing first? Not at all. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you to HowlRound and, and the Playwright Center for having me as a guest on this panel. And I'll share that in my background, you see I'm on Clinkit Ani of the Occoquan and Takaquan people, also noted as uh, Juneau, Alaska. So I'm, I'm zooming in from Juneau. Um, uh, gosh, what comes to mind is, and I'm gonna speak from the point of view as a woman of color, as um, Japanese heritage, fourth generation in this country, and I'm a descendant of great grandparents, grandparents and parents who were incarcerated during World War II. So I come from a history of activism and community building. Um, that's just in my DNA about how we recovered and what happens now with the learnings that I have from that historical trauma. And um, what comes to mind is every opportunity is so key. When I was um, doing my uh, directing assistantships at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, there was Yellowface and they were just starting into that initiative around equity, diversity and inclusion. And so gratefully they listened, they leaned in and listened. And there were other instances and I being an activist, I just wanted to tell them that, you know, in a, in a good dialogue. And that what that brought was um, over the course of two years of assistantships, uh, an actual uh, residency for playwrights of the Pan-Asian, Middle Eastern, North African and native indigenous from our diaspora. It's called API two by two, two playwrights, two plays. And uh, Madre Shaker and Susan Stanton were the first candidates. And it told me that to support them, give them even space, it was just a, it's just a week long, but to bring them there, have that exposure, and then be able to put that on their resume. Now granted, if they didn't come, they're fabulous writers, they would have gone on and they're having wonderful careers. But I just wonder having Oregon Shakespeare Festival as having had a residence there, they started getting produced almost right away. You wonder, right? That, that opportunity to have, to be in a place that's really visible, known, and Bill, Bill Ross was starting to shift it to do more new work in addition to Shakespeare and to, to open up what is the canon? Is it just the Western European canon? Is it just Shakespeare's canon? Or can we start to build in what they were also calling the American Revolutionary, um, you know, that initiative, that long initiative is still going. Um, what does it mean to give those voices the opportunity where there's resource? How can we share our resource? So that, to me, that, that championing of, of playwrights from my own community was everything. And then they have the great honor and fortune to be of service here in the artistic directorship at Perseverance Theater. I cannot imagine, and I'll get emotional. <laughs> I can't imagine Vera not being here. First of all, she's another uh, BIPOC human artist with me in this theater that's historically white, you know? And as we shift that culture and we're really working to do that, 
um, to what I call decolonize, indigenize, in order to liberate those spaces and, and to liberate, I, I believe in liberation for all. Her being with us on staff is critical. It could not be happening the way it is, as thoughtfully, as deeply, even as quickly. So mm -hmm. that, that's been powerful. And I think she's been, her, her presence, who she is and her writings have absolutely impacted this theater, who we are and our ability even to persevere through these times now. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, put a brilliant just... artist at the center of your work and there you go. Mm -hmm. We also power. share power. So she's in many meetings. I want to make time for her to write. <laughs> We're always like, you got to write, you got to write. But um, we, I feel like gone, and maybe again, I'm coming from my lens, my point of view. Uh, I think for me, gone are the days when an artistic director throws up a season that they slate and supposedly they've, you know, consulted with their staff or with other artists and community but they often make the final decision. I don't make the final decision. It's a very collective decision. So gone are the days where you throw up a, a scene or a slate of plays for the season and make everybody else scramble to make meaning, find money for it, burn out trying to you know, market it and, and even produce it. We look at the slots. We look at, is that lining up well time-wise, timing through the months of that season. So, and I know that's maybe your next question, but, um, but yeah, Vera's in every, in, in all those conversations with us. I can't think, I couldn't imagine it without her. Yeah. <laughs> Alyssa, you have been in, you've worked in so many different theaters and so many different theater spaces, but always surrounded by playwrights. Um, and I'm wondering kind of what have you experienced versus as going back to what Pearl was talking about originally around sort of having those drop-in moments when you're on a production or especially on a new play when everything is so you know, high octane um, versus being able to really dig in and have a longer engagement and relationship. What have you, what have you learned? You know, I've, um, uh, um, in the course of my career that has really been focused on, I think, bringing new work and playwrights into theaters, um, it's so lovely to hear that this, that the, that the Mellon Playwright in Residence program continues to uh, create these amazing relationships and lay the groundwork for ongoing things like Pearl's relationship um, with the Alliance. Um, and I oversaw, I think, several rounds of, of Mellon Playwright in Residence um, uh, opportunities, and they were, they were wonderful. Um, I will say specifically to Latte Da's relationship with Harrison, is that I think it's it's worth noting that that's it it actually um, it's not funded by an outside residency. Um, it's really a relationship that uh, began uh, and continues because of a um, a real um, appreciation for Harrison and his work, and that Harrison has continued to make. Um, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, a home base. Um, and the opportunity to sort of have that relationship grow, it, you know, it's now at the point where um, Harrison will say, I have an idea for something, or here's the first draft of a new work. Does it feel like, you know, something that Latte Dal would be interested in? Um, and we also have ideas that we will say, hey, we're thinking about this and Harrison, would you like to get involved and be the writer on board? So it's the organicness um, of how that relationship has, has happened um, has felt really special. Um, thinking about um, Vera and Harrison and Pearl, when you guys were talking about your relationships of uh, being in the being in the space with audiences. I was thinking kind of from the producer side of that, you know, it feels so often like audiences fall in love with actors, right? They have favorite actors that they want to come back and see. And of course, because those are the people that they get to see 
usually over time in different roles, in different iterations, they get to learn different sides of that actor and establish a kind of sense of connection and I think even kind of pride and ownership about how they've come to know that actor as an artist. And I have watched our audience, our board, the other actor, the other artists, like feel that way about Harrison. Like you see, oh, this is, this is a musical that Harrison wrote. And then here's a beautiful um, love story that Harrison wrote. And then here's a historical project that Harrison's working on. And so to watch people kind of um, begin to have that sort of ongoing and multifaceted relationship with um, a, a playwright, um, in the way that I think it most often happens with actors and audiences um, has been really extraordinary and, and feels very, um, very much a part now of sort of who La Teda is. I'm, I'm so, um, a question that I get asked a lot is, so like, what's so great about playwrights? This is mostly from non-theater people. Theater <laughs> people don't ask me a play, a person who runs a place called the Playwrights Center, what's so great about playwrights? But non-theater people are like, God, you've really just spent like 25 years just hanging out with them. They must be really like, I, and I'd be like, well, tell me about a play you love and they'll tell me a play. And I'll be like, right, so that happened because that person told that story and that story came from their heart and their mind and their body and their lived experience or some combination and on and on. And so I really go back, I think Vera to you centering this idea of storytellers. It's actually kind of what we talk about more we're, we're having a lot of questioning about the word playwright even right now at a place called the Playwright Center, just because, you know, we are thinking constantly about what, a, what is more porous, what allows more people into space and what are things that are perceptions that keep people out. Um, so I think we're really looking at the constructs of all of that. But so let's talk about storytellers for a moment then. And I think um, I'm curious for all of you, um, and maybe Pearl, if you would kick us off with this question, but um, I'm curious what you think makes playwrights, as Alyssa was saying, differently than actors um, in a unique position, uniquely qualified to help us re-envision and see our field forward in a time of great shift that we're in right now. I know for me personally, storytellers obviously have this incredible skill and ability to create context, to lay out beautiful poetry to tell stories that maybe many audiences, Vera, as you were talking about, or Leslie, you were talking about, haven't seen before. And this might be the first time that they're being um, brought into space and context. Um, and I think we need those uh, dreamers and philosophers and poets right now, my gosh, in this world, my gosh, more than ever. But I'm curious for the five of you, so maybe Pearl, you'll kick us off on what are your thoughts on how playwrights can be powerful on their own in their writing, but also in this moment when you're an artist where you're seeing all these theaters really shake and tremble right now, and the future is still kind of uncertain. How can playwrights be really powerful in relation to producing theaters right now? Well, I think, um, you know, I think that a playwright is always dealing with ideas. You know, what is this world I'm writing about? What is my idea about the world and about how I think um, people should get along with each other in the world? And it's a, I think it's a very different kind of questioning that you have to do as a writer um, than you have to do as an actor. And I love actors, I admire actors. So I don't mean it's a, it's a more important task that we have. I mean, it's a different um, thing because what you're doing when you write a script is starting with an idea. What do I think about something? So of course you're, you're gonna come back to how do I feel about it? But I think the idea of looking at something and figuring out the world that it's in is part and parcel of what playwrights do. So that I think that the, um, you know, when you look at who used to start theater companies, and I know this is true in the African-American community, it would usually be a charismatic playwright and a charismatic opinionated director. And they would drive each other crazy and they would write shows and they would do shows. And, but it was because they were talking about ideas. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? So they would have mighty feuds and all that 
because somebody had a different idea about what to do. And I think we lose that when we're only talking about money. How much did the show make? How much does the show need to make on every ticket in order to keep this giant building um, lit and air conditioned? So that I think that when we get away from people arguing about the ideas and sitting up late at night drinking wine and talking about ideas, then you end up talking about audience development and grant applications and money. And I think talking about money, although it's really necessary, especially when you're running a great big theater, um, and even when you're running a small theater, which I used to do, it's a different discussion than the discussion about why are we doing this? You know, what do we think is important about telling a story? You know, when people ask me, do you think theater is gonna go away? And I say, of course not. You know, we are like the ancient art form where as soon as people could make a campfire, we made that campfire. And then we all sit around it in the dark and tell each other stories. I mean, what a, what a great way to come through history. And now we have big theaters and we have big lighting plots and all that, but we're still doing the same thing. We're gathering in the dark in community to listen to somebody tell us the stories of who we are and how we act and what it looks like when we're wonderful and heroic and what it looks like when we're horrible and we lie and we do bad things because all of those things make us feel more alive, more human. And I think that's the thing that playwrights have to bring. What is it that brings people into the theater? The idea translated through the characters. So you gotta have them. You know, the, the, the question of what makes playwrights so important, it, it, you know, it almost made me feel snippy, like, what do you mean what makes the playwright so important? And I think of those discussions I've had where people say, well, you know, the play is really written in the rehearsal hall. No, it is not. The collaboration takes place in the in the rehearsal hall. People become a family who tells that story, but that story has to take place in the in the playwright's idea, and then it becomes something you can collaborate with. But you got to start somewhere, and I think it starts with the writer. Can I can I offer up a, a very uh, immediate and and somewhat personal response to that? which is we're here in Minneapolis um, where George Floyd was murdered on uh, Memorial Day. And um, Harrison, uh, last fall, uh, a play of his called Broadbent, Arkansas, um, that's about a, a musical um, that's about three generations of a black family dealing with um, uh, violence at the hands of the police. Um, premiered at the transport group uh, in New York. And um, I went to see it because it was Harrison and I loved it. I thought it was an amazing production and it's written as three very um, interesting, it, two, excuse me, very interesting musical monologues um, but with composed uh, by Ted Shen. And um, as Harrison can tell you, I, I I cried during the show, but at the time, I remember having a very, um, a primarily kind of producerial and I guess aesthetic response to it, which was, I, I remember sitting there and thinking, this is a, a beautiful play that feels kind of experimental in the way that it, it is exploring musical theater. Um, this is certainly topical, it's beautifully done. Um, I would, I think it would resonate for audiences in Minneapolis. So we began a conversation with Harrison and Ted Shen about producing it in our upcoming season. And we were scheduling it and we were budgeting it and we were doing all of those institutional things around this play. So then I'm sitting here in Minneapolis on the morning after Memorial Day and George Floyd has been killed. And my, the first thing I did that morning is that I picked up a copy of Broadbent and I read it because I needed in that moment, I needed Harrison's voice. I needed to connect with those characters. I needed an individual artist's, a storyteller's grounding in what was exploding around us. And for me, that ability to, that's why playwrights matter because in those moments when uh, the world is a little bit larger than we can comprehend it, um, 
it is it is those stories that that ground me and I I know would ground our audiences. But um, it was such a specific like I need Harrison's voice. I need that play at this moment. I need to touch base with those characters to help me through this very specific moment. Thank you for sharing that. Other friends. Well, Leslie, you shared a little bit about Vera, but I'm Vera, I'm curious maybe to hear the the reverse from you. It's been it's been great hearing both your experience, but also Leslie, you saying this is what it means to me. It's invaluable. I can't imagine being in this position in this collective at that theater right now without Vera's voice and, and experience in the middle of it. What's that been like for you, Vera? Like, what do you, what do you feel like you've been, I know how it's changed you writing wise because you were sharing it, but I'm curious, you, you artist, Vera, you whole person, you lived experience, Vera, how has that shifted you? Um, I think of, and actually even with what Pearl was saying and Leslie was saying, what's interesting about um, specifically the Clinkett culture, all Alaska Native, uh, most Alaska Native cultures have sort of released their values and this kind of these list of values. What's funny is with most of it starts with like respect or compassion. The very first thing that uh, is on the, the Clinkett list is responsibility to clan. <laughs> and then you go to obedience to protocol. <laughs> I mean, it's a very, um, um, it's it's pretty strict. <laughs> There's an interesting uh, level of responsibility there. And that's honestly what I, I first think of, um, whether it's to the theater and that responsibility to represent the theater well, as I represent my clan well, as I represent Clinkets well. Um, I go through a lot of like, EDI and racial equity trainings and, and these kind of, they emphasize not to feel the need to represent all native people or all people of color. And that is true. You should not expect anyone to represent everybody, but we're very trained to do that. <laughs> like that is a, a pretty core part of the Clinket culture to uh, represent who you're speaking for, who, who you work for, who you were taught by. Um, I was very young when my grandma told me you're the only Clinkett person anyone's ever met. Act like it. That is such a core part of who I am in representing my art. Um, it's not my art, it's my clan's art because I'm speaking for all of them. It's Clinkett art now, it's Alaska Native art. Um, this might be the only experience anyone ever has <laughs> with Clinkett art. Take it seriously. And there's that sense of, of responsibility with the theater. It's um, sometimes a heavy responsibility or an exhausting responsibility, um, which is why it's great when there are more Alaska Native staff, or Alaska Native uh, people there, Clinket people there. Um, and I think with what's currently going on, both with the theater, but also just as an artist, as a person, I feel that responsibility. Um, one of my first sort of, uh, things out of the gate, I've been doing these um, 10 minute short plays with Stream On. And before George Floyd, I was sort of booked for the Juneteenth <laughs> um, uh, date. And I was like, oh, okay, no pressure. Um, <laughs> and really thought about even saying like, I don't know if this is appropriate for in this moment of all times to be taking that spot, but really feel the responsibility of examining my own feelings in that art has always been the strength I see with audience connecting with it <laughs> when I sort of go super specific. So it was examining um, Native uh, and specifically Alaska Native people um, and our <laughs> sort of responsibility toward the uh, Black community. Um, and that was sort of the sort of responsibility I felt to put out there. Uh, you didn't see a lot of it, certainly from Alaska Native people, not because we weren't doing it, because we're just a very small community in a very big world. So it was responsibility just sort of keeps coming on and on again. Um, and that's what I feel toward the theater. Today, we actually, it was interesting, we're talking about this. 
just today we're going over whether we even have my play <laughs> at a certain time um, and whether that's the responsible thing to do for a native play, not for my art, but for a native play at this time, do we have the budget to do that service? Will it look bad for native people if this is not done well? And that sucks, honestly, that that has to be part of the discussion, but I take that very seriously. It is part of the discussion. It should be until that's not true anymore. Thanks, Vera. Um, I'm going to just pause this for one quick second. Folks uh, who are tuning in and watching, uh, this would be a great time to start getting your questions in. And we're already starting to get some questions in, which is awesome. Uh, so the, again, you can type it into the comments on Facebook uh, on the live stream, if that's how you're watching it. Or if you want to email your questions, you can email them to questions at pwcenter, like playwrightcenter.org questions at pwcenter.org. Uh, and then we'll start queuing them up as is happening already. Leslie and Harrison, I, I just want to make sure you all get a chance to chime in as well on this question. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, so I, I'm going to sort of go back. I think the original question was something about like playwrights and their superpowers. Mm -hmm. um, so I will speak to superpowers. Um, I, I, I started writing plays because I heard voices and I didn't know where they were coming from. And I called my mother and she said, why don't you write down what they're saying to you? And so I wrote them down and it became my first full length play. And I do feel like something that I um, feel strongly about uh, as like a particular skill and I think a skill that many of my playwright friends and colleagues have is the ability to listen. And I do think that sometimes in this very busy, very loud, very chaotic world, um, we need people who can sit back and take it all in and process it and then report back to the world. This is what I heard, this is what I saw sitting back there in the corner. You thought I wasn't, in it, you thought I wasn't paying attention, but actually this is, this is where we are. And like, if we don't like where we are, then we collectively need to do something about that. Um, so I, I think like my superpower and a playwright superpower um, is this ability to listen and synthesize and report back. And I think that that's a really important process, especially when the world is turned upside down um, and like what's left, what's right. Uh, I think that it's important to have some people who can say, here's what I saw, here's what I hear. Um, if we don't like it, then let's work together to change it. Can I like to say how much I admire Harrison's mother? That was such a great answer to your child. That was lady. so fabulous. I just have big respect to your mom for that answer. Excuse me. No, I was just like, amen. <laughs> Leslie, what are your thoughts? Uh, and, and remind me questions that why we love playwrights and uh, I think um, how are yeah in this in this moment you know how how are you finding it? Um, we've heard from you a little bit about why it's so critical to have Vera sort of there and and what her voice and, and thoughts have meant. Um, but I guess just a little bit about you know um, uh, how, how, what is unique? Yes, as Harrison said, what's the superpower? Uh, that you've seen. And it doesn't even have to be a perseverance. It can be in, in any of the places you've worked. You know. mm, mm, such a good question. It seems like a simple question or simple answer, but it's, it is multifaceted for me. Um, well, I have to say, first of all, I'm so grateful to Mellon for renewing Vera's, um, you know, her, her residency because that supported her to be in this new chapter with us at Perseverance, where I get the opportunity to, um, to actually experience her being on staff and being with us. Like you said, it's not an episodic. Just come in, be in some rehearsals and then hopefully show up at, you know, we can bring you for opening and then you're gone. Um, but what I, what I love and I think the superpower is, and, and maybe this is from my own research too, uh, from uh, listening to Japanese American psychologists that are deeply invested and spent their careers as like a, a, around historical trauma for our people. And one of the things that 
really occurred to me was I heard Satsuki Ina, a leading psychologist for, in the Japanese community, talk about DNA. Now we know so much more about DNA, but hooked to that is DNA messaging. So messages come from, you know, all the way through your, your lineage. And so now I'm starting to have this new sort of look at it that I think playwrights, storytellers, as you were saying, opening that up, storytellers from all the different ways we tell stories, cultural traditions, you know, how we tell stories can be through movement, spoken, um, music, dance. It can be many, many ways we tell stories and, and any combination. I really believe they share the DNA messaging in their stories and therefore we're getting the wisdom of our ancestors. And it could be through the dysfunction that we still have to heal from, <laughs> the internalized whatever, you know, but it also could be the wisdom of don't do that again. You know, we know that didn't work for our survival. So I really believe it's really, that really shifted healing my own historical trauma, shifted how I look at storytelling and where and how those, those storytellers channel, you know, um, even a process their own healing process, their own lived experience and where all the influences come from. But I really think there's something in there about how that DNA messaging is influencing and informing the wisdom that comes from those stories. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been profound because I really feel Vera does that. She's even just mentioned how she honors her ancestors and the values, but I feel, I feel that in Vera and the way that playwrights help us, like you, someone mentioned how we experience their culture or the culture of the storytelling they're, they're sharing with us and how we actually create the environment for that to come through. I do feel that experiencing the culture, and I think this is becoming, I haven't really talked to you yet, but I've been thinking, musing on it though. I really think that's becoming a strong feature of your work. People go away feeling that they experience the Clinket culture and the way she's figuring out how to engage an audience. So they're not passive. They actually feel like they're a part of a ceremony or a part of what's actually happening. And I wonder if that is informed by the DNA of your ancestors and how you so generously share wisdom. And I would say too that, especially again, coming from uh, my own diaspora, I do think there's something about the fact that what's a superpower for storytellers is they're making sure, whether conscious or unconscious, that we prevent erasure or they're helping mm -hmm. us recover from erasure. So those stories that come through are critical because they help us actually learn and learn the real, what Yuri Kochiyama, my, um, one of my mentors in activism who worked with Malcolm X, he said, be a bridge builder. So those, the storytellers are the bridge builders are helping us remember and know that, and she used to say, learn the true history. So I believe the storytellers are helping us learn our true history, you know? So, so that's, I think, a real superpower. Those are real important superpowers that they bring. And even more so as we get more inclusive and equitable, that is gonna be allowed, the space for that to happen. Is, it, it needs to happen, it's justice for it to happen, but it also means for our, going forward, look at COVID and what, what, we're, what the uprisings are bringing. We need that to happen. We, it's our, mandate now to make sure it happens yeah it's beautiful mm -hmm. um thank you i i i'm uh i want to i've not synthesized but i but i'm hearing all of that and i it, that was exactly why i asked the question is i'm i'm curious about uh you know as we're in this moment where theaters are closed or they're the buildings are closed um what can we be doing? What can we be working on to get to these exact kinds of actions? How can we get back to Pearl's stories or Pearl leading a discussion or Pearl or Vera sitting with folks and saying something's not right about this and I wanna take some time and think on it and walk on it and come back and, and bring that to the group or you know, how Harrison goes from one space to another and brings with him hard work and joy and the rigorous questions of his mom. Um, I think it's really, really, really incredibly unique. And I think we, we've always needed it. 
Um, and we really, I'm part of a, some, a series of conversations and discussions right now that are very much about reinvention that are very much like, it is amazing to me for all of the years that I've watched same, 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 or same, let's just call it same. It's obviously kind of the same, even if it's not really the same, 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 same. I'm just watching things fall like that right now. And I'm, I'm, what I'm, I'm sad and grieving for the loss that is real loss. And I'm also, um, I'm really hopeful. I'm really hopeful that, that, that the Pearls and Beers and Harrisons of the world, that the Alyssas and Leslies of the world are gonna be the people whose voice are gonna carry us forward. Um, I'm gonna to go to our first question. This is coming in from Abraham. Hi, Abraham. Um, Abraham says, this is clearly a time of massive transition in the theater world, especially for early career playwrights trying to find their footing. So what can any of you recommend? What can early career playwrights be doing during this time uh, to foster healthy relationships with institutions? What would be helpful? Playwrights, what are you doing? Artist leaders, what are you, what are you, uh, what do you, what, what feels helpful to you? I could say, I don't necessarily know what's what you should be doing. I have to tell you what I am doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. honestly, it's just everything. Um, I'm saying yes to so many things right now. Part of it is that feeling of responsibility of, um, there are a lot of creators who don't feel they can create right now. And that's incredibly legit. We're in this pretty traumatic time and people are still going through trauma. Um, I, I process trauma by creating, <laughs> fortunately for me. Um, so that, so I'm sort of, I'm saying yes to teaching. I'm saying yes to writing. I've never written a Zoom play before, but I've now written several of them. Um, I am fortunate and, and privileged enough, obviously, to be working in animation <laughs> also right now, which is primarily still in, um, but on the theater landscape, we, I mean, most of today was spent talking about what that means and how I can still be creating art that goes to the public through a season that probably won't be happening in person. Um, I have possibly overextended myself, <laughs> really realizing that this week that uh, there probably should be a few more no's, um, but it's as an early career playwright, I'm sort of well-established more in journalism. And I actually wrote a novel way before I ever wrote plays. Um, but playwriting, I, I still am definitely more early. Uh, it's still at a say yes to anything that looks pretty cool and fun and that I can put my passion into. I will say, I don't know where I fall uh, personally in the sort of early, emerging, I have no idea where I'm at, but I, I will say something that um, has always uh, been beneficial to me is to find ways to reach out to individuals and talk with them. Um, I, I, I feel like I would not be where I am now if I hadn't said, hey, um, can we have a coffee? Which you can't really do now, but you can Zoom, you can call, before so um they can't really maybe say no to you <laughs> but i mean find find ways to sort of reach out whether it's via facebook or instagram the people who you respect and whose work you love and who you want to know more about and who might have some kernels of wisdom for you or or just stories of the things that they've done and the people they've met and the things that are keeping them going that 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 personal reach out and I, I've always been blown away by the generosity of those who have gone before me, those who are, you know, ahead of me in, in the journey. And um, so I would encourage you to, to reach out and say, hello, this is who I am. And uh, I, I'd love to, to, to talk with you. I'm gonna move on to another question. Um, this is a, a question coming in from Zan. Uh, Zan asks, speaking of erasure and storytelling, how do you all feel on the panel about the erasure going on in this country of the monuments being taken down or stored 
and facts being taken out of history. Interesting. So maybe this question is partially about um, in a moment uh, where um, so much change and necessary change is needing to happen. How do you as storytellers reckon with, as some of you had talked about sort of painful history versus other versions and how do you, how do you reckon with that in your storytelling? Well, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, I actually wrote this, um, I wrote this Facebook post that kind of went like Alaska viral, which isn't viral. <laughs> um, we have our own little, a little Facebook um, <laughs> community up here, but um, it got huge really fast. Um, obviously a lot of opinions on it, specifically about um, some statues around here that uh, portray people who have enslaved Alaska Native people, who have um, committed genocide, who have um, sort of brought in the white supremacy attitude, and we name everything after them. We name streets, we name communities, whole communities, um, our whole, this we call Tukatnu, this inlet that we're on. Um, it's still called Tukatnu, um, but most people know it as Cook Inlet, Captain Cook. Um, this is, symbols matter. They just matter. <laughs> they would not be up there if they didn't matter to who put them up. And in fact, an awful lot of the most contentious ones, the kind of funny part is people are acting like the ones up here are put up by like Michelangelo or something. Um, they're put up in like the 80s by oil companies some of these, like, um, they put them there for a reason. And that reason, and this can go on a whole long conversation, the bottom line is it's, they were put up to support and claim white supremacy for this spot, this land, this community um, in different ways and glorify that, glorify what they did, which was uh, kill and enslave and rape our people. Um, so, um, I don't know if the question actually that's being asked is about the statues being the facts that are taken out of history. Um, the statues themselves are literally monuments to facts being taken out of history. Um, these mm -hmm. facts, um, are put up there as false facts, fake news. Um, an awful lot of what those statues represent are fake news. Um, they <laughs> represent this glorified person that didn't exist. Um, we're portraying a false narrative by continuing that and we're erasing the history that was here. We are naming Cook Inlet and putting a statue up of Captain Cook over uh, a body of water that had a name for 10,000 years, um, which spoke to the land, which described it. It was not claimed by it. Captain Cook literally didn't even get off the boat here and we've named so much after him. Um, so the facts being taken out of history to me are the false facts. Um, and the discussion around these histories now is wonderful. The fact that so many people are talking about Captain Cook and what he did or did not do, people had no idea. We are creating history right now by taking down these statues. We are creating history and uh, informing that history and educating on that history much more than sort of sticking a statue up there to claim this land. So I will now step back, go see my Facebook post for- <laughs> <laughs> I want in on that Facebook group. I want in the group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> Erasing the erasure. I love that. I love that. I think that's so important what you said, because when people say, you know, you're erasing the history and you're erasing the history, and it's, I, I just agree a thousand percent with what you said. What we're doing is correcting a false narrative that has gone forward. We're not saying, let's take down these Confederate statues and then the, the wonderful history will be gone. You know, it's saying, no, we want to talk about what really happened. We want to look at who we really admire in terms of being really a great American human being, who do we really admire? But I, I think that's so important to always say, we're not erasing anything. What we're doing is bringing forward the real history of what happened. And it's so present 
I mean, I live in Georgia. Every morning I walk my dog in a park that was a big Confederate battle site. And this is an all black neighborhood. So we're walking there and it talks about, you know, how they, they took some of the people held in bondage and made them help create the battlements and all of that. So the history is very present, but it has to be um, told in the correct way. And you can't say, no, we can't talk about that part of who Jefferson was. No, we have to act like that was a wonderful love affair with Sally Hemings, you know, because it makes it easier for us to admire him. And it's like, no, we have to tell the truth. I think that's the whole idea is that we always have to tell the truth and shaping the narrative one way or the other is wrong because what we're trying to get to is the truth. What actually happened? Who did what, who said what, and what was the outcome of all that? But you got to start with the truth, not the shading of that narrative to make your group look better. Sometimes our groups look horrible. So then that has to be part of the story that we tell. Mm -mm -mm. This moment, this moment. It does feel to me, Pearl, like um, I was in a conversation this morning with someone in, uh, in another country and they were saying, what does it feel like in the United States? And I said, there's millions of different experiences of what it feels like to be in this country. And um, right now, and there has been for decades and centuries and centuries and centuries, but what it, what it feels like to me is partially that um, as sort of we're talking about, there is a, an unwillingness to translate and subsidize the emotional and historical pain and trauma that this country is built on in all of its different moments um, any longer. Like we're not gonna, there's no euphemism for it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, no, it's not cook this and cook that. No, mm -mm, nope. And uh, when, when gratefully the name of the lake that I live by uh, was changed back to Bidet Makaska, um, and removed <laughs> the name of the lake when I moved here. Um, it's a it's a really different thing, and it gives what a what how powerful it has been for so many different people and who have lived so many different lives to actually do the work that should have been done all along, which is to speak its name and not um, speak a false name and and keep the blanket on that our work is to remove a blanket. Uh, as much as anything else and get our head out of the sand. Uh, this country has done that long enough. This time I think to one on. of the really um, wonderful things is that we begin to see when we talk about different groups in this country that our own group is not the only group that was ever oppressed. You know, that we have to talk about there were so many different kinds of people oppressed during the history of our country for so many different reasons. But once we all start hearing the stories, we can realize that all of our stories about oppression are part of what makes this narrative. And who was oppressing who? Who named that monument? Who took that land? Who held those people in bondage? And why? You know, what did they do? Because if you really start talking about the history of the country, you'll start talking about economics. You know, you'll start talking about class. You'll start talking about all the things that as long as we, and I'm in Georgia again, so that's why I'm saying, as long as we are stuck only talking about black and white, that's all we'll ever talk about as to say, as opposed to saying, let's talk about internment camps. Let's talk about Captain Cook. Let's talk about all the different ways that people have been oppressed and how we can share those histories. We can talk about Stonewall. We can talk about how people use their experience um, as part of oppressed communities to get freer. You know, what did we do? What did that one do? What did this one do? And compare notes until we can all say, this works, let's do this. Let's all vote for good people who never lie to us. You know, that works, let's see how that does. Let's have public education where people actually teach everybody how to read. That works, let's do that. But we have to realize we're all trying to do the same thing, which is wrap our minds around a very blood-soaked history in this country that we live in and figure out how we can take that blood-soaked history, tell the truth about it, and then move forward. But until you tell the truth about it, it's right there. That blood is right there, and it's not going anywhere. The truth is the thing that begins to allow us to see each other, you know, as part of one community, one nation, all those things. I'm, there's a question that's come in that feels like my instinct was like, oh, 
no, this isn't the right moment for that question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, because I always think it's the right moment. I wanna talk about joy for a second. Um, how are you, we talked about, I think Vera, you know, others were talking about, it's hard to think about how to create right now. And because we don't know what this whole thing's gonna look like on the other side of it yet, we don't know. And so I'm curious about, there's a question, there's actually sort of a second question embedded in another question that is about how are you finding joy right now as theater artists? Um, how are you sharing joy? How are you finding it personally? Um, and what does that joy look like in this career, in this life, in this, uh, in this approach? Alyssa, how are you finding joy? <laughs> I think I, I'm, I will try to address that maybe a little bit tied to what just came before, which is, I, you know, I, I was, artists have, artists and maybe writers in particular, not just in theater, but in all mediums, like that's, that has what that is what artists have done through time, right? Is to to uncover the um, to uncover the the hidden histories and narratives and and present them and dig for that truth. Um, it's not so. It's uh, it's interesting because in some ways and i don't want this to sound naive because it's it's livelihoods and it's rent and it's purpose and communication and all of those things that i think everybody is are, are the very real things that people are struggling with when theater is shut down but i think for me there is there is a the joy has not completely gone away because um, I get to live in a space with artists who have always done that work and continue to do that work. And so there's a, I think there's a continuity for those of us who get to be around artists um, that that storytelling has always been done and is continuing to be done. And I, I, think can't, won't stop being done. Um, so I guess that has kept joy for me is being able to, uh, you know, continue to talk and read and um, dream with, with artists. Others, joy or inspiration or hope or? I think growing up in an activist family, one of the things that my parents used to always say is that you have to find joy in the struggle because we're gonna be involved in the struggle. We're gonna be involved in freedom struggle from now until we're free. And we don't know if that's gonna be in our lifetime or when, but we have to find joy in the very act of struggle because that act is seeking the truth, standing up, learning how to be free, getting other people together so that there is a great joy in claiming your own humanity, claiming the fullness of who you are and who you can be. And I think that at moments like this, when there are so many um, forces arrayed against people who are trying to tell the truth, who are trying to keep back that truth and keep back that growing sense of community and, and righteous anger about things. I think at that moment, there is a real exhilaration in saying, I'm going to be part of that. I'm going to march if I'm, if I got good knees and I can still march, I'm going to write if I can still do that. I'm going to do theater in people's driveways. I mean, I'm a 60s child. So we used to do theater anywhere. We used to drive people crazy. You know, you drive up a bunch of kids in front of a pool room because we were going to bring the revolution to the pool room. And they were like, we are trying to gamble and drink some beer. Would you please leave this area? But we were, we were excited. We were trying to do it. We were trying to make it work. And I think that's the thing is it's not that in moments of great struggle, joy goes away. In moments of great struggle, 
you rise to that. You feel more mm. joyful. You have great love affairs. You mark with people you've never seen and feel mm. like you knew them for your whole life. So that it's not like, you know, now I'm sad because the struggle is so intense. It's like, great. I want this. I want this moment of transition in American history. I want us to stand up and say there will be no fascist marching in this town. There will be no police brutality like that in this town, in this country, in this city. I want that. And that's where the joy is. How do you find something to write at a moment when you're balancing the horror of what we see with the joy of knowing that on the other side of that, there's going to be something wonderful. There's going to be all of us figuring out how to work together. And it'll be lovely and great and confusing and messy. And it will feel so good. So I don't get depressed. I'm like, okay, now we got 400 people marching down the street. Tomorrow we're going to have 600 marching down the street. Let's go push over City Hall. You know, let's claim a park and, and live in it. Let's do something together. And it's not sad. It's exhilarating and wonderful. And I'm, I'm happy to be alive for this. I have to say that um, what gives me joy is, uh, and thank you, Julie, for bringing my attention to it, Aaron Tripp. Alison Hicks, Mina and Dipankar from Pangea World Theater. These friends are on the chat right now. <laughs> they give me such joy. They are in the revolution with me, with Vera, with each of you, Harrison, Pearl, Alyssa, and Jeremy. I know you know them. Um, it's finding colleagues that are willing to risk dismantling what does not give everyone liberation it's being standing, I know that sounds ableist, but standing side by side with them in the struggle to actually um, do the, what I call the most rewarding work you'll ever do in your career, which is that equity, diversity, and inclusion access work, which is anti-racist, anti-oppression, which is decolonizing to indigenize because you'll reclaim your own humanity we don't realize how much has been stolen from us, our own humanity from these oppressive, long, long now time white supremacist, capitalistic colonial patterns. They have stolen our humanity from us. And you may get a little privilege from it that just kind of gives, puts gaps in our thinking, um, uh, puts it off a little bit, but you're really suffering under the lack of your own humanity. So to be in the fight and the struggle with comrades that have truly stood by each other and, and advocated for each other uh, uh, due to tremendous, tremendous um, marginalization. That's joy for me when we move, those, move the needle forward together and we actually reclaim our humanity together. That, and you get that glimpse of what full liberation is. That's joy for me. That's purpose, it's cause, it's, it's everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. It gets me up every morning <laughs> and keeps me up late at night. <laughs> yeah, I'm so I'm so glad both Pearl and Leslie went first because I was like, how do I even word this? To <laughs> <laughs> what they're saying, um, I think that sense of you can cry and laugh in the same conversation. <laughs> you. Can, grieve something at the same time you're celebrating what's coming. Um, it's such an interesting time because sort of reading these, you know, books by that Dr. King wrote and John Lewis wrote, and you're like, oh, we're still doing, I mean, you could just transpose phrases and like, we're still here. At the same time, so many more people agree that what they're fighting for is right. Yes, we still have so many people um, that are agreeing, uh, I guess, on the other side that are sort of championing oppression. Um, and I think what I'm able to see right now in two sort of communities, which is um, the elders, I think probably why I, I was having a hard time describing what, why I was so emotional about watching uh, Representative Lewis's funeral and, and going and it's I didn't know him you know, but we knew him um, we knew his work and what I was finally able to figure out was that he was able to live to see so much progress on what he's worked for 
And in that same vein, the elders, the native elders in our communities that have fought so hard, um, they're able to see so much progress. And a lot of them are like, right now, eh, we've, been, we've been seeing worse. <laughs> we've, we've had, this is no big deal, you don't even know. Um, and for them to be able to see like, oh, we got this because we've seen it and to, and to have them say, wow, how far we've come. Um, an episode of Molly of Denali that my grandmother commented on because it was literally just about how far we've come. And then the other community being the children. I just came off of two weeks of an entirely uh, native uh, theater camp, Clinket for the most part. And we produced 25 new, cutest, most adorable native written plays ever. <laughs> like, and to see how much more confident that they are in their culture in these things that were literally illegal in my father's time they are proudly proclaiming and correcting us on. Oh my goodness, when you've been corrected by this little clinket child on a language <laughs> culture, um, how one, busts the ego a little bit, <laughs> but two, then you're just so proud of like, wow, this is amazing. And how much this makes me think about where we're going. So those are a whole bunch of things I find joy in right now. Harrison, bring us home. Wrap us up. No pressure. Well, everyone went so deep. I mean, just that was beautiful. Um, I was going to say, I, <laughs> I made a mix on Spotify, <laughs> and it includes Nina, Gladys, Aretha, Dinah, um, and I listen to that every day. And that right now is not just giving me joy, which um, it is giving me joy, but it's also giving me life. Um, so I, that's, that's all I will say is I've got a, 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 a bomb, a bomb playlist on Spotify, joy. Harris and David Rivers, ladies and gentlemen. Gladys and Aretha. Talk about people who are actually telling the truth. There you go. There's the actual truth. We don't need statues. I think um, I just want to hold a little space that for this idea that, you know, tonight and, and these conversations are not so much about coming up with the solution. There's obviously no such thing. Also a fallacy um, in mythology that there's a right way to do anything. That's what got us into the trouble in the first place, I think, with so many things. Um, or that Zoom is the answer, <laughs> or that that's our path forward in theater. I, I, I also really do, I know we're talking about these bigger ideas and I really do wanna hold some space for the individual artists and the theater uh, practitioners and those who are working at theaters who are going through what they're going through in the last number of months. There's not enough um, um, hard space for for those folks who are our community and will be still, and we will figure this out together. Um, uh, but at the same time, I am really hearing increasingly more arts leadership discussions, not just in theater specifically, but talk about putting the values and the vision of these organizations at the center of it. And I just can't think of a way, I think as we've heard tonight so beautifully from all of you, of a better way to do that then, you know, hire a playwright. I was on the, I was on a panel the other day and someone was struggling with something and they were like, I just, I don't know what to do. How will we, we actually have a little bit of money but I don't know how to do, solve X problem. And I was like, hire a playwright. It literally is my answer to everything. Oh, that didn't work out. Yeah, I mean, you could hire a playwright. So I, <laughs> my feeling is surely there's like 3,500 bucks somewhere that someone has and let them speak, ask them to come, pay them for their labor and their work and their time and their experience, pay them to come in and have conversations with you, with a board, with a marketing staff, but less you know, cynically than just the infrastructure of all of that with all the people. Let these beautiful storytellers be at the center of all we do. May that please be a hallmark of the time ahead of us where we are leading with our heart and our spirit uh, and the spirit of John Lewis and so many others as we go forward into the world. I want to thank 
uh, Pearl and Alyssa and Vera and Harrison and Leslie so much for your great spirit and thoughts today. Thanks so much to HowlRound and Knock and all our great friends out there. Please tune in for our next conversation in two weeks from now with Mfuniso Udafia, Jen Silverman, and Sarah Govins. And thank you all so much for being with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you very soon. Have a great night, friends. Hugging, Yeesh. Zoom hug. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs>